were very fresh pa uh, partners of GitHub last year, so we wanted to have a number of talks uh, uh, specifically around uh, um, uh, the GitHub uh, GitHub platform, but from different perspectives. So this year, we, we're certainly not leaving the GitHub focus, but we are widening the perspective a little bit. So uh, as uh, um, by now, we have been talking about developer velocity. Our own CEO, Magnus Juvas, did that talk. We had also a sca scaling agile using Azure DevOps safe and at scale. And we do have partners from BDD, but also Matthias Olausson from ourselves uh, talked about that topic. Uh, last week we had how to use GitHub Actions with security in mind with a, an external guest who is Rob Boss. Uh, all of these uh, talks, both from last year and this year, you can be found on YouTube. Uh, today is the number four, and as I mentioned, we are going to talk about uh, how to modernize applications, uh, specifically on Azure. Uh, and those who are going to bring this topic to us today will be uh, our Matthias Olauson again, who is the CTO of Solidify, and as well, uh, Mihai Bors, who will uh, be describing uh, the key steps in moving uh, in the movement of modernizing applications. So with that said, I'd like to hand over to Matthias and uh, to Mihai to introduce themselves and then kick it off. So very welcome all of you. Great, thanks. So a quick in introduction to myself, uh, Matthias. Again, CTO, Solidify, a uh, long time um, developer and, and DevOps uh, uh, tools specialist. Been working a lot with, um, with uh, Microsoft, both as an MVP and now uh, as a Microsoft partner. So really like to get the opportunity to, uh, to share some of our lessons learned and, uh, and best practices. So today, looking forward to um, to have a small part of the presentation here together with uh, with you, Mihai. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Mihai Bors. I'm working as a senior consultant at uh, Solidify. I usually help our customers with both cloud and software architecture, DevOps, and uh, development. Um, I'm passionate about software development in general, especially on code quality. Uh, so with that in mind, let's get started. I think so. So what can so we talk the, about today? Yes, so the focus of this uh, presentation will be on the key steps of modernizing web application and services by moving the workload to a newer, more modern environment like Microsoft Azure without any expensive investments. We will show how to check if the application in its current state can or cannot be migrated, what options are available for migrating, how to use managed services to provide security, availability, better uh, customer experience in, and, and better customer experience in, um, in general. We will also show how to take advantage of the governance, governance tools that are available in Azure to ensure that uh, compliance policies are met and that we can release the application in a secure fashion without affecting agility or innovation. So let's continue with the next slide. Yes. Good. So uh, when migrating to Azure or to any other cloud platform, platform, there isn't uh, a single uh, one-size-fits-all strategy. The right migration strategy will depend on organizational needs and priorities, but also on the kind of application that we are migrating. The investment of moving to a POS model or developing a cloud-native application model for all the application within the organization might not be that efficient. So it's up to the organization to kind of define the goal or level of each individual application based on how mission critical the application is for the business as well by the investment budget. So these slides show the possible possible paths that we can take when moving or strategies that we can take when moving to an existing application 
to, to the cloud. Cloud uh, infrastructure ready, also known as shift and lift, is the approach where we take, for example, the application in its current state and redeploy it to VMs in Azure. The benefits, for example, of this approach is that it doesn't require any code changes or re-architecting the application. The next level or strategy is cloud optimized, which might require some code changes, but still does not require an expensive re-architecting of the application. While in the previous approach, um, the focus was on VMs, here the focus will fall on platform as a service, and in our case in Azure, on app services. Uh, the advantages of this stage or uh, approach is that you can benefit of modern cloud technologies and take advantage of additional cloud managed services, for example, related to databases, cache as a service, monitoring, auto scaling, continuous integration and delivery and so on without any expensive investments. Cloud native is the next level and it's used for more mission critical application. Here we, we use cloud native application and microservices to enforce agility and new scaling limits. It also requires re-architecting, rewriting the entire application. So this migration approach might be quite expensive. As we can see from this picture, the more effort we put into it, the more benefits we will get out of it. So the more effort we will put in migrating or, and modernizing the application, uh, the more time we will have to spend on delivering business values to our customers. Uh, uh, for example, if we look at cloud native technologies, we can automate security checks and put fine grained guardrails uh, at every level from the machine or metal to the image container. To, to ensure and to reduce uh, any risk or breaches. Uh, this is a short overview uh, of different strategy, uh, strategies, but as mentioned in the previous slide, the focus for today is on cloud optimized approach, meaning the purple arrows, uh, and on the fully uh, manage services in Azure with a special focus on app services as well as on um, on how customers can incorporate innovation in their apps through this migration journey. Okay, so let's move on to the next slides if we don't have any questions until now. So today um, every company runs many different applications that are kind of essential for the business and for the services that they provide. Of, of special uh, importance, I think, are the, the ones that are customer facing. Um, and why they are of so, of so important is that it's, it's by, it helps organizations to get kind of deeper engagement with their customers. So in the today's digital market, customers are more important than ever, and they even have higher expectations than they used to have. So recent studies are showing that customers kind of expect fast applications where they can have a personalized experience and this experience should be even consistent across different devices that we, we kind of use uh, throughout the day. Um, identity and sensitive data handling is also highly, highly important. Customers will never return back to application or websites that leaked their personal data. So let's uh, continue. So Microsoft Azure um, kind of helped us to tackle most of the previously mentioned um, challenges of modern application development. 
fully managed services help small teams to provide high quality experience um, without any expensive uh, investments. For example, we can provide quality of service on web apps by taking advantages of guaranteed SLAs or automate scaling to handle traffic peaks. Data-driven intelligence can improve the way we kind of interact with our customers or with end users and give them a more personalized experience. Azure mobile services can help teams to provide a more consistent cross-platform experience to their users. Uh, we can be also more agile and productive by automating uh, deployments to get to market faster, as well as using, for example, integrated development and monitoring tools to tackle issues, for example, more efficiently. Uh, we can also integrate, for example, more easily with different services and components of an application, as well as with existing legacy investments. Uh, by using some pre-built uh, connectors that are available um, uh, within Azure. We can handle security and privacy without any specific uh, investments in this area. We can forget about updates, patching, support or major breaking changes by staying always updated and benefit of the privacy, compliance and security certification that the cloud platform usually provides. Let's move on. So the process of um, modernizing um, web apps with Azure has three main stages, assessment, migration and innovation. Uh, the first step consists of determining whether the application is compatible in its current state with Azure or it needs some, some uh, small adjustments. The second is bringing the application to, to Azure through a migration tool or by bringing your code or bringing your containers. The last step consists of setting up monitoring, automating deployments for future releases, as well as pushing innovation further by taking advantage of the existing uh, services, managed services or tools available in Azure. Okay, let's move on. Great, <clears throat> so I'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, save your voice. Mihai, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the first steps that you could go through in the modernization journey. So, uh, like Mihai mentioned, it's nice to have a process where you, you put the migration into or the modernization into a business context um, to, to understand uh, and, and have a rationale for doing the modernization. And always it's always a good thing to start by looking at what you have and what it would mean to modernize it. Uh, and there are different ways, of course, to do the analysis. Um, Microsoft provides a service that's targeted to uh, to benchmark, let's say, the technology that you're using on an existing application and see how that would map to uh, to the Azure services. And in doing this modernization where we where we look at replacing uh, on prem environments, particularly uh, with cloud environments, um, there's a bit of work to figure out if there's a good fidelity. And depending on, on your prerequisites, uh, it's always nice to, to get some help to, uh, to, uh, to see if we're using the right services and the most recent services. So, I mean, even for us that have been working with Azure for quite some time, um, might miss that there is a new opportunity and a new service and so on. So, um, um, again, do the assessment, take a look at uh, what services that you are using today in your application and how it would map to, uh, to the cloud. And just for, for fun, let's take a look at this uh, app modernization or uh, migration assessment that's available uh, from the Microsoft uh, website. So this is a good landing page, has a lot of good content on 
on uh, how to go about doing things that we will talk about in the presentation today. So one of the first thing is that we can go to this uh, um, assessment tool and then uh, we get a compatibility report. So we'll talk a little bit more about this later. So let's uh, just browse to uh, let's see how, how our website, the public website uh, um, would migrate and if that would work. So just type in the URL and click assess. So let's see what it said. Oh, check mark your site's framework and hosting model are fully supported for migration to app services. So that's uh, giving us some confidence. Uh, then it's giving me some hints on things that I might want to, to dive deeper into to, to uh, remodel my application in the cloud. But what also quite interesting is that it is able to, uh, to identify a lot of the components that my existing site is actually using and then uh, give me a suggestion on how we could set it up in, uh, in, uh, in Azure. So, uh, in, in this case, I would, of course, I know that we were using ASP.NET um, and other services, um, but there is a lot of details that we should uh, consider when, when migrating an application, and it's always easy to just look at um, one side of it, maybe only infrastructure, only application. So this uh, list is, is a good starting point as well to, to make sure that we're not missing out on things that might become a an impediment uh, down the road when we start migrating. Um, so uh, quite interesting to see that uh, it, it figures out a lot of the underlying details that we we're using. And I was kind of uh, surprised to see that, yeah, this is a lot of stuff. So uh, it would be interesting to just figure out if we're actually doing all of this. Um, we can always uh, look at some some other tool. I think I, I browsed uh, Aftonbladet. Um, just to see that if you're using different technologies, there's support for, for not only Microsoft core platforms, but um, there's a deep integration with, with Java systems and, and, and Linux as well. Uh, so let's see if this one comes back. Yeah, so this one is also compatible, but uh, here we might see that, okay, this one is apparently hosted in another cloud, whatnot, but gives me... Uh, uh, some information. Again, this is, uh, as we see it, more uh, uh, an interesting example, but it shows that this is the, the type of analysis and assessment that we should do. Look at our services that we are using um, and do an assessment. Next, we would be ready to, uh, if we feel that, okay, this is a, an, an application that is movable to the cloud, then uh, we can start looking into how we can migrate it. And um, roughly you can consider this in, in uh, three different uh, ways. One is to, to see if we can do uh, an easy lift and shift and possibly use a migration assistant tool. And um, uh, together with the assessment tool, there is also an, a migration tool that helps us um, just transfer uh, things from one environment to uh, to Azure Web Apps and and, uh, and a database. Um, generally, not um, the most practical solution, but if you have a, a small application, small site, maybe this is a convenient way to do it. Uh, but in general, and we will talk more about that in a bit. You you want to uh, to have good control over your environment and and how you um, uh, deploy and so on. So. The approach that we usually start with is looking at, okay, we have an application and we have found that we have a compatibility on uh, infrastructure services. Then let's look at how we can bring the existing code over to the services by essentially redeploying the code um, with more or less existing pipelines for continuous integration and delivery. We only, in quotes, need to, uh, to uh, remap our deployment processes to, to use. Uh, service connections to our environments in Azure and so on. But if we have decided that the migration is initially a one-to-one, -one, that we want the, the same application without uh, re-architecting it, then uh, this is usually a, a very cost-efficient way to, um, to migrate. 
and with that modernizing um, the application as a whole. Um, the third option would be to uh, to go on the containerized route. Um, typically, or in many cases, our existing application is is not a containerized application. But by doing that, picking up this track, we uh, we take one step closer to uh, let's say a cloud native environment, um, meaning that we get to to learn the practices for containerizing our application, uh, managing Docker containers. Um, running a container containerized system. So it's a good first step in, in modernizing the way we work that makes us more ready to, to go cloud native in the next step. But again, um, after you've done the assessment, uh, you need to come up with a migration plan. Sometimes you can use a migration assistant. Most often it's more about setting up a new environment in the cloud, taking advantage of all of that, and then uh, move over your, your application um, in its existing form. But again, containers might be a good next step as well. So as usual, it all depends. So Mihai, do you want to continue with this one? Or did I lose you, Mihai? Sorry, I was. <laughs> yeah. our, uh, I, I took over the screen. Yep. We have also uh, we have also a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, I guess everyone can read it. Um, a very common issue that is raised during modernizing is the move from on-premise single tenant to multi-tenancy -ten in the cloud. Any comments on security scaling tenant separation patterns? Yeah, I think today we, we're looking at modernizing the, the infrastructure and uh, let's say our DevOps architecture um, as a first, a good first step. Mm -hmm. um, but in my opinion, um, if um, you want, if you have a, a system that is built up on, on multiple tenants in its current form, um, it might be something when you do the assessment and, and look at the migration path that um, you might find it's it's a good justification to to go to uh, to to a multi-tenant uh, solution while moving over to the cloud. Um, but I think uh, multi-tenancy that could be a good topic in its own. Uh, I mean, so maybe we can see if we have some time in the end. We can we can elaborate more on this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, definitely uh, could put that on my list to uh, to have as a session uh, mm -hmm. maybe after the summer. We will tackle some of these um, these topics later in this presentation. So I think right. we can continue, and then if uh, if if it still doesn't answer the question, then we can uh, take it back at the end. Yep, sounds good. So let me share the presentation. Can you see the presentation now? Yes. Okay. So after the migration step, there is the innovation part. Um, we mentioned at the very beginning that uh, what's uh, that the customer experience is kind of the key for success. We can fully realize the benefits uh, of the move to the cloud by enhancing out our application with different tools and services in Azure. For example, uh, we, we can see here three categories, optimize operation, customer experience, and extend with serverless, for example. So we will go through most of these topics later on. We will check how, uh, how we can use Azure Monitor um, and set up CI CD with help of GitHub and Azure DevOps. Um, we can also talk a bit about how we can use Azure Functions to extend the existing application with an event-driven approach um, by, for example, using Azure Functions or, or Logic Apps uh, to, to integrate with different services with low code or no code at all for faster and simpler innovation. Um, but usually, before we 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 
can start migration. The, 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 always it shows up the, the question regarding security, governance, and so on. So I observed, uh, for example, several times that the first approach when moving to, to cloud is to create a sort of guardian or gatekeeper, someone who is responsible for the cloud environment and must have everything or must control or have, have control over everything that goes into the cloud to ensure compliance and security. Even in a cloud environment, security and operations staff still want to be kind of in control, kind of old habits, kind of die hard. So this, this is hard to scale and it quickly becomes a kind of bottleneck. So we still need someone that is kind of in charge of the cloud environment, but the guardian should define or the gatekeeper should define what can be and cannot be done in a more secure fashion, ensure that compliance rules are followed by simply relying on tools like Azure policies, blueprints to do their jobs. Azure policies will prevent resources that don't follow the defined rules from being provisions, uh, while blueprints, on the other hand, will ensure that resources are provisions are provisioned the way they are supposed to. Uh, the, the Guardian also can organize subscriptions into containers called management groups, for example, and apply governance conditions to the ma management groups. So all the subscriptions within a management group will automatically inherit uh, the conditions applied to the management group. Azure monitoring. Azure monitoring uh, helps to observe and react, for example, to resource exhaustion and to scale the service accordingly based on the traffic and other metrics. Um, Azure Advisor shows, um, um, for example, if there are potential improvements in your cloud resources in terms of high availability, performance, security, and even cost. Security Center, which is the next feature, uh, allows us to detect misconfigurations and to fix them from a central position, as well as to check for compliance requirements. And in the end, you can even uh, use Azure Sentinel to detect threats and investigate suspicious activities with help of artificial intelligence. So back to you, Matthias. Yes, so um, next we wanted to, <clears throat> to look at, um, I guess, a favorite topic of ours <clears throat> that uh, uh, again, modernization has multiple dimensions, and um, with with Azure, we get the opportunity to to modernize uh, how we run our applications. So um, when we do that, um, it's a great time to uh, to start looking at how we can define and model our infrastructure so that it's easy for us to uh, to uh, to do new stuff and to enable. Uh, more efficient development uh, going forward. So uh, again, I think it's important to try to rethink how we 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 look at our infrastructure, you know, the, the classical uh, go from 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 uh, treating them as pets to go to a, a cattle approach, where uh, we we don't be we're not so personally involved with each of our server environments. So. What we suggest, if if you're not already practicing it, is to implement infrastructure as code, meaning that we uh, we uh, script um, the setup and configuration of the environment our system needs, put it in source control, um, and then we can version the environments and the configuration uh, and have it in sync with our application versions. So with that, it gives us a good framework to to uh, automate, speed up setting up new environments. We can ensure at a di much deeper level that the infrastructure is uh, 
is um, compatible with a with a version of the application that we're running. And we can track changes in in uh, infrastructure setup and configuration um, by using infrastructure as code. So even though it's not really modernizing the application itself, it's it's modernizing the way we uh, we uh, we manage our application, which of course is a is a, a real enable enabler to uh, ensure that we uh, can be efficient in our modernization work. So if we move to the next slide. And the next uh, part of this is to uh, to of course have uh, efficient pipelines. And this is probably something all of you have already, but um, um, the, the latest trend and best practice is to, uh, to script pipelines and uh, rather than using visual tools. So even if visual tools are nice to, uh, to get started with, um, if we model our build and release processes as code, we get the same benefits as having the infrastructure as code, uh, meaning that we, we get um, the possibility to version control, have a change history, um, much easier to, uh, to uh, create templates that we reuse, um, and so on. So um, taking advantage of a, of a good um, pipeline system is something that we should build into our modernization as well. And on, on the Azure platform, of course, we have Azure pipelines and we have uh, GitHub Actions. They're similar in capa cap capabilities, as you all know, um, but um, both very capable of doing not just uh, compiling source code, so we, we use the same infrastructure to uh, to uh, create environments, let's say. So if we, we want to to set up a new environment, we, we should use a pipeline to do so. Then we get uh, rid of person uh, dependencies. Anyone can reconfigure an environment um, so we can be much more efficient in our um, application development. Um, the runner system is, is essentially uh, task runners, so we can automate other things as well. So it doesn't have to be compile, deploy. It can be things that trigger on other events in the system. So uh, an example in the next slide is now that if we if we do infrastructure as code and pipelines as code, then we can tie this together. So I mentioned setting up um, a pipeline that deploys the latest infrastructure, probably a, a natural thing to, to start with. We define uh, how our infrastructure looks. If we use, let's say, ARM templates, that's, uh, that has a, a behavior that the first time it runs, it creates resources. If I run the same script again, it will ensure that the, the environment you know, and the resources still look like the script says, so we can manage configuration drift that way. Uh, and then we can um, uh, can can uh, take this uh, further to uh, to the next step. I see, oh, we're not seeing the right slides. We should be on dynamic infrastructure. That's what I'm seeing. No, modernizing journey, assess, migrate and innovate. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, what if I reshare my screen? Yeah. Then should I do that? Yes. Okay. Feel free. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is the slides. I'm not sure. <laughs> that looks fine on my end, but again, that's just me. So uh, I'll I'll share the screen here. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let's see. So infrastructure as code. Can we see that now? Yes, it yes. looks fine. Thanks. Perfect. OK, so then this was what I talked about. And here we see an ARM template as an example of how we can define stuff, the, the resources uh, that we, uh, we have in our environment. And the same for, uh, for a pipeline as code. Then we have our uh, YAML pipeline uh, defined for uh, Azure pipelines or GitHub Actions. Again, code. And like in this example here, we can see that in the end of the script, we were using the, the GitHub Actions pipeline to, to uh, check if we have a resource group 
if it's not already there, we create the resource group and then we deploy the ARM template to ensure that we get an environment that is suitable for um, the uh, stage I'm deploying to. So uh, I get it to run once in, in dev and then I can run the same thing in, in the test stage to ensure that the same configuration apply, is applied to the test environment and so on. And then this was where we started to get confused, but uh, tying it together, we can do really interesting things with dynamic infrastructure, like, um, like let's say we, uh, we want to have a new environment. Whenever we create a pull request, then uh, pull request create is just a different trigger type for GitHub Actions um, and pipeline. So whenever there is a pull request created, we can run a script. And in this example, we, we run a script, uh, ex exactly the same script that we would run when we update uh, the main environment. But uh, here, let's say we, we dynamically create an environment using the same ARM templates specifically for testing the code that we're right now uh, pull requesting and, and, re and reviewing. So this step here would uh, create an environment, deploy the code in the PR to that environment, then we can go through the pull request, test the application, and then we can end it by having another um, pipeline run whenever the when, when the pull request is finally closed, which then deprovision the environment. So by starting using infrastructure as code and pipelines, we can do uh, much more sophisticated uh, um, setups for for uh, for our applications. So now, Mihai, let's talk about what we actually use the infrastructure for. Yes, so as mentioned in the beginning, app, service, uh, app services will be the focus of this presentation. Um, app services is Azure Platform as a Service, which is a complete development and deployment environment in the cloud. It enables us to deliver everything from simple apps to more sophisticated enterprise applications. App services are hosted on App Service Plan, which is a separate resource in Azure that needs to be created. App Service Plan defines the size of the server that your apps are running on in terms of CPU, memory, disk, the geographic region where the servers are deployed, as well as the number of instances uh, your application is de deployed to. Uh, shall I share? I was just uh, trying to move to the next slide, sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, as we can see from this conceptual picture, we can host multiple app services on a single app service plan. Uh, app services and Azure Functions, for example, can share the same app service plan. This is useful when you, when you don't have, during, for example, night, you might not have high loads on your websites or applications, and then you can share the resources to run different different jobs or functions. This could be a, a useful scenario. Uh, as we can see from this picture, we can horizontally scale to handle increase or decrease in load to avoid paying for infrastructure that we don't need. Uh, scaling can be also automated based on time intervals or metrics. You can also scale up and down for CPU, memory, and disk. Several instances uh, of the VMs in, inside the app service plan can be load balanced, but for the for the applications that are storing the the, the user states on the web server, uh, you can even have session affinity, so users are directed back to the same server. We can even host containers in app services, both Linux and Windows containers. Uh, and probably many of you will wonder why, why do we need containers when we can just use our code? Well, by, by enabling containers, we know that app services supports code um, deployments. For, for kind of a variety of applications or languages or end runtimes. But if the one that you want is not supported, then you can package your application configuration and runtime into a custom container and deploy that one to, to the app service plan. 
containers, uh, another reason is that containers virtualize the operating systems. Using containers can help to overcome some limitations of running code natively on the app services. For example, when you deploy code, you have limited or no access to, to the operating systems of, of the VMs that are hosting your application or that are running your application. For example, this is excellent for feature for legacy apps. Uh, Multi-container is also supported and you can achieve that by using Docker Compose and even uh, pod uh, description, Kubernetes pod, pod description will work. Okay, let's move uh, on to the next slide. So pricing tire of an app service plan determines uh, the disk space, number of app service, um, app services that you can kind of host on the app service plan, number of instances, and it also determines some of the features. Um, for example, if we look in this picture, we can see that auto scale, for example, is supported only for standard, premium, and isolated um, uh, pricing tires. Let's move to the next one. Uh, we can easily configure scaling, as we mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, we can choose between manual and auto scaling. Uh, we can define, as we can see in this slide, the minimum and the maximum number of instances. Uh, we can select if you want to, if we want to scale on um, on a, a metric or on a time interval. For example, in this in this picture on the slides, we we chose to scale on a metric, and we also defined, for example, two rules: a scale out rule. To, to scale up based on a CPU average metric. So when CPU is above, for example, 60, then we can increase the instance count by one. But we need to have also a scale down or scale in uh, rule that, for example, if the CPU now is below 50% for more than five minutes, then we want to scale, decrease the instance count by one, for example. As we can see, there are different metrics available that we can use and select and configure as we want based on our needs. So let's move on. Um, deployment slots um, is a feature of Azure App Services that allows us to have multiple multiple versions of our application. It can be used as different environments of uh, your application, but I would not really encourage that. I, I think best is to have symmetric environments that are provisioned to code as infrastructure. Um, a deployment slot is a complete app within the app service with its own application settings, configuration, own place on the file system, and even its own instance of Kudu portal. The first app service that we actually created in, uh, in Azure is actually the production slot. Um, the power of the deployment slot is that you can swap them. So you can deploy your application to a staging environment, test it, and then switch it to production if if all the tests are green or if if uh, uh, the ones that are doing the acceptance tests are are um, tested and the tests are okay uh, usually after a deployment the application uh, gets restarted and uh, the first request is usually slow so the de deployment slots also gives you a way to, to warm up your application before you promote the new version into the production. An uh, interesting feature of uh, deployment slots is the auto swap, which is a feature uh, that will automat automatically do a swap after 
uh, a deployment, but only after the application is warmed up. This is a very useful feature when you don't really use the staging environment to, to test your application. You just use it to achieve, for example, zero downtime deployments. Um, traffic routing um, routes, for example, a certain percent of the traffic to a deployment slot, allowing us to test a new version of the app with a limited number of users. Um, as it can be seen in this image. So here we chosen to, to we chose to to route 10% of the traffic to the staging environment. Um, this is very useful feature, for example, for A B testing. Uh, another important feature of the uh, deployment slot is the sw swapping of configuration. Since each deployment slot has its own configuration it can you can uh, um, configure to avoid swapping the configuration for example if you want to test in the staging environment with another database connection when you do a swap you can choose not to swap the settings as well that's a quite good uh, feature yeah. Uh, what's important to note is when doing database migration on a slot, on a deployment slot that are sharing the same database as the production, it can break the production. So it's always important to have uh, databases, migrations that are backwards compatible. Uh, deployment slots also run on the same app service as the production. So we have to be careful when doing uh, with our test loads. We shouldn't do, for example, performance testing if we have several environments, if we achieve this several environments through deployment slots. Also web jobs or jobs can continue working even after you do a swap. So you have to be careful in case you have a job listening on uh, on a service or service buses or queues that the messages might be processed or consumed with the old code. A limitation of the of the deployment slots is that you only have five deployment slots if you choose uh, a standard tire, while in premium and above you have twenty. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Right. So another feature of of app services, and not only app services, but on on many other resources in Azure, is the managed identity, which eliminates the need for developers to manage credentials. So it enables Azure resources to authenticate to cloud services. Uh, without storing credentials in code. Um, for example, there are two different types of managed identities. A system assigned managed identity is restricted to one identity for each resource, and it's tied to the life cycle of this resource. So as soon as you delete your resources, the, the, the uh, identity will also be deleted from the Azure AD. You can grant permissions to the managed identity by using, for example, Azure Role Based Access Control. User, user assigned managed identities are created as a standalone resource and have their own life cycle. So you can um, have, uh, for example, a VM or an app service that utilizes multiple identities assigned, managed identity assigned to, to this resource. In the same manner, um, a, a single identity can be, for example, shared between different app services, if you want to, to, to do that. Uh, so let's move, move on. Since we talked about a bit of configurations and, and uh, secrets, let's continue to how we can configure our application and handle secrets in a cloud environment. As Matthias mentioned before, everything that can be should be code, pipelines, infrastructure, tests, and even configuration. 
So by having everything as, as code speeds up and simplifies the provisioning of the and configuring of the systems, especially at scale. And by treating, for example, the infrastructure or configuration or even the pipelines as, as code and applying, for example, software or engineer, software engineering practices like version control, peer code reviews, refactoring. You can even run static code analysis on your uh, infrastructure as code or configuration as code. Um, we can make our kind of changes both in configuration, infrastructure, and pipelines, repeatable, auditable, and much safer. safer. Uh, this will also help in case we want to deploy uh, our application and infrastructure or configuration, uh, for example, for several tenants, or as Matthias mentioned before, uh, with dynamic um, environments. Um, but we don't have only configurations. Most uh, application, applications need some kind of secret or, or kind of keys to communicate with other services to, to provide the functionality that they have been designed for. So these secrets usually tend to kind of be spread between pipelines, running containers, Kubernetes secrets, and We've seen a lot of examples that sometimes they even end up in the source control. So the idea is to use a key management service, uh, such as, for example, Azure Key Vault, that in in uh, that can centralize the the secrets for a specific application and environment. So it's kind of recommended to have um, uh, one Key Vault per environment and application into only single location, into one location. And we then we can use the same uh, role-based access control for accessing our secrets within the, the, the key vault. And as again, by doing this, um, we, we gain auditing, traceability, and even control over all our secrets. Uh, do we have any questions? I guess no. So then let's let's continue and back to you, Matthias. All right. So um, yeah, let's uh, okay. touch on a on a final topic. Was uh, someone wanted to share something or no? All right. So um, we looked at um, at the, the different ways we can host um, a typical application in Azure. Uh, when we talked about um, modeling infrastructure and automating um, the environment setup and, and so on. Uh, when when doing this type of migrations, where we, we're not re rewriting the application uh, specifically, um, but putting into it into a new environment, then monitoring becomes a really important topic. Uh, because how, how could we know if the application that used to work on-prem um, or in a, in a previous environment um, works correctly in the new environment in Azure, unless we have some good telemetry? And uh, to start with, uh, it's it's great to to have a design where we where we uh, uh, can e extend the monitoring solution, but. Um, if we use something like Azure Monitoring with Application Insights, um, if we were connecting to that already, good, we get that type of telemetry, but we probably don't have that in a typical uh, uh, classical ap application that we're modernizing. Um, but even without adding Application Insight, we can get a lot of other information from, from the environment in, in uh, Azure Monitoring, like uh, how the resources are behaving, uh, uh, look at uh, security events, and so on. So all the type of telemetry that we get from the outside of the application, we can can get directly. Um, so we understand if we're uh, setting up the right type of environments, that we have uh, the right capacity, that the scaling work, 
uh, works like Mihai talked about um, and so on. So um, again, we can leverage Azure monitoring as is, and then in our time we can we can extend it by by integrating deeper in our applications, and then we get the telemetry inside out with exception logging and all the other things that we we we're used to having. But with this, we get a centralized logging system. Mm -hmm. Also, by adding application insights to your application, you get quite a lot out of the box. You get you get all your requests and responses logged. You get uh, all the external dependencies that that communicate through HTTP, for example, database dependencies, and you can even see a, a more uh, an application map of, on how all these dependencies talk to each other. Yeah. Also, we get uh, free correlation, uh, so we we can correlate all the events that kind of uh, hang together, um, and this is done even across different services. Mm. Yeah, so this is definitely a, a good topic, and we will dive into this deeper in a, in a coming session. And. Good that uh, we didn't get much question in the chat because now we, we used up all the time. Um, but uh, thanks for, for uh, joining today. And, and again, we focused on, on, the, on application modernization, not as a code thing, but to, to start in talking about it as a, a thing that we do um, from, the, the, from, from many sides of the application, like the software architecture, the infrastructure, or architecture and the, and the DevOps architecture and put this into context where we assess what we actually want to gain from this. So we, we should pay attention to the anal analysis, uh, come up with the right way to migrate, and then we can move to innovation. So in coming talks, we will talk more about cloud native and how to, to actually modernize the code as well, not only uh, the application uh, the way it is running. So let's see. Okay, click the wrong button. So thanks again for uh, for joining. Um, just reach out. We don't have that much time left or none at all. Uh, so hopefully we'll see each other in a couple of weeks again, where we'll look at developer productivity. Um, so. Uh, if you're not following us on, on LinkedIn, do that, and then you, you get notified when the next show is out. And again, thanks for joining. I don't know if you have any last comments, Mihai or, or Malin. No, nothing. But uh, or just to say, of course, do reach uh, if you uh, pop questions just after one o'clock here. Then uh, do reach out to Mihai or to Matthias or anyone else in in Solidify, of course. Uh, good to see you all and. Uh, Yes, uh, let's see uh, uh, See you again at the devel Developer Productivity, where Magnus Timner, also from Solidify, will be, uh, host, uh, will be running the show. So thank you all for today. And feel free to post questions if they arise later in the chat, so we will try to, to answer them as good as we can. Yeah. Great. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mihai. Thank you.